The Feast of Trumpets Lesson 7 Life in the Spirit 4 Well, we've been in the book of Acts, and I'd like to proceed. Again, we are characterizing the many dimensions and aspects of life in the Spirit, thinking about uh, last time, you know, if it kind of sounded like I was saying God can tell you to do something, you don't have to obey it, or God tells you to do something, he may not mean it, or some other thing. I, and I hope you understand that is not what we are saying, but that life in the Spirit means that you will perceive many voices you'll you'll hear voices you'll have you'll be influenced you'll have concepts in your heart that provoke to action and some may be god and some may not be god and they must be proven they you must exercise yourself to establish uh, the truthfulness of um, of some of these things and so we're not trying to be pat nor are we trying to be evasive and saying somehow you can never tell or, or or any of these things but I hope if we accomplish anything it's to show you that the simplistic view simply does not hold its life in Jesus Christ is very very rich it's an adventure and no two days are alike it's uh, there's always something new something some twist in circumstances or in his personality or in the scriptures that you had no idea of and so uh, that's what life in the spirit really introduces you to but there are pitfalls because sometimes the twist in the road is deception it's meant to distract you it's meant to destroy you and it's placed there by a cunning personality that that wants you done in and um, so that's why we must exercise ourselves very carefully and learn what is our responsibility concerning life in the spirit so that we can be faithful in doing what God asks us to do are there any questions from last time anything that may have not have been yes said that uh, in life in the spirit that it behooves us to prove all things. Have you given a, a kind of a, a list of how we go about proving all things? I know scripture is a good test. Um, I'm sure prayer is one. Did, but did, have you actually given a list? No. Um, and I don't think uh, we are. Because there is none. As soon as you make a list on how to prove what God's will is, that's exactly what Satan will do. As soon as you say, well, you just use the Bible, Satan will quote the Bible. He did to Jesus. As soon as you say that um, if you hear a voice, it has to be God, you're, you're going to hear a voice. Uh, so one of the main things we are emphasizing, emphasizing is you cannot create a list. You, you can look at examples in the scripture and see by circumstance how it works um, and how it is described and gain an understanding. But to turn that into a rule that says therefore this is what you have to do in order to tell what is God and what is not God um, you can't do that. And the church does that handily. Just buy a book on how to determine what God's will is. And uh, I'll give you a good one. And now this is popular, and I don't want to step on anyone's toes. And that is the idea, if you have peace about a decision, that's a sign that it's from God. No, it's not. Quote, quote a Bible verse that says, How be it, brethren, don't you know that when you have peace concerning a matter, be assured that this comes from God. See, it doesn't, it doesn't go that far. We do, but the scriptures don't go that far. The scriptures say things like, the wisdom that is ab from above is first pure, then peaceable. 
But to say that the wisdom from above is peaceable is a far cry from saying, therefore, if you feel at peace, it must be God. For example, God is a spirit. Therefore, if a spirit talks to me, it must be God. Can you see the, the flaw in that logic? Well, the wisdom that comes from above is peaceable. Therefore, if I feel at peace, it must come from above. You just can't do that. And, and, and the human mind loves that. The natural mind thrives on this kind of thing. Because if you can reduce it to a rule, you don't have to actually live in the spirit, which is worth your life to do so. And pretty soon here we'll talk about the cross because without the cross there's no life in the spirit. And you try to live in the spirit without the cross of Jesus Christ and you will have Babylon. You will have absolute chaos and madness. Mm -hmm. And so there's a price that is paid uh, when we live in Jesus Christ. And so it's, we don't like the tricks. And so we really, we're avoiding that in, in what we're doing. Rather, what we would rather do is to go through the scriptures and show by example what happened when Paul did this and what did Jesus say. And so you get, by exposure, you get familiar with the dynamics of life in the Spirit. What would you do if, now of course see, you'll, you'll know this answer, but, but maybe I should, uh, maybe I should uh, couch it in terms. I'll do that. <clears throat> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invent an episode to trick you, okay? Let's say you come to church and the minister up front says, let's say you go to a, a new church and let's say you have a ministry of, um, let's say you're an evangelist and uh, you didn't uh, have a service that day so you felt, well, I think I'll, I think I'll just pick a church and, and attend and, and you do and the minister sees you and he recognizes you and he says well you know ladies and gentlemen I'd like to introduce you uh, this gentleman here is an evangelist now is that the devil or not in fact he may say I've heard this man and what he says is the truth is that God? Well, let's turn it this way. Can that be Satan? Definitely. It definitely can be Satan. You say, oh, come on, you're, you're pulling my leg. Where is that in the Bible? Where is that in the Bible? That episode actually happened in the Bible. I just changed the names to protect the guilty. Hmm, I, I was successful in uh, covering it up. <clears throat> Once there were two men who daily went to prayer. These were apostles. And there was a woman that followed them and told everyone, these men are of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. Now, is she correct? Absolutely, absolutely correct. Well, who was it? Uh, Peter and John? They, they listen to this. Day one goes by, day two goes by. I don't know how many days go by. And they are weighing this. They're judging it. It sounds right. Hey, they're apostles. They are men of the Most High God. And they do show people the way of salvation but I think they detected something wrong. The Bible doesn't tell us what it is. And that's why it's a real good example of life in the Spirit. And finally, Peter says, enough of this. I know where this is coming from. And he casts out a spirit of python. That's what it is in the original Greek. A snake spirit out of that woman. And it turned out that that spirit in her was used to create profit for her owners because she could say things that were true and when that spirit was gone it made them plenty mad there are other lessons there but think about that 
what she said was true. So a minister standing up front saying, <clears throat> here's an evangelist, and boy, what this person says is right on. That just tells you about the accuracy of it. Doesn't tell you the source. And evidently, <clears throat> it takes a certain amount of weighing. And I think that's why it took Peter a couple of days. Oh, because that's so close. That sounds so right. And maybe the first day he really thought, well, wow, Lord, thank you for this tremendous testimony. I mean, this is great. It, it, he has Bible for it. Let another man praise you and not your own lips. That's in the Proverbs. That, that's really great stuff. Wow, Lord. And maybe even the second day, hey, you know, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses. But probably his perception was telling him there's something wrong, there's something wrong, there's something wrong. And we have no clue really what the process was other than the rest of the scripture that, you know, try all things, prove, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Don't believe every spirit. We'll look at some of these scriptures. Prove, you know. Just because you hear something doesn't mean it's gone. So that's why we are not going to create a list of rules, because there aren't any. Yes? Okay. In that case, okay, we've got two scriptures at least. The one that you just quoted, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. And we've got another one, First John, that says, test the spirits. Right? Okay, how, if that's commanded of us, how then do we prove all things? If it's commanded of us, of us to test the spirits, how then do we test the spirits? Okay, let me... We, we want to obey those things. Sure we do. But let me respond that your second question is really the same as your first question. Let me... Uh, and. One of the examples that we have used to kind of help is to try, if you're trying to explain to someone how to ride a bicycle, you really can't do it. You can, they obviously know they're supposed to pedal and they obviously know the bike isn't supposed to fall over, but the rest is up to them. And you can help. You can push the bicycle and you can say pedal faster, but the skill is somehow mastered simply through the process of doing it. And many things in the spirit are done exactly that way. Let me give you a commandment that God would speak that you can handily do, but I'll, I doubt that you can tell anyone how you do it. He says, remember that I am the Lord thy God. It's a commandment. Well, how do you do that? How do you remember? Well, you kind of do it. You make up your mind, I'm going to remember. Something happens, and you do it. But you can't reduce it to say, well, first thing you have to do is to uh, clear your mind, and the second thing you have to do is take a deep breath, and then uh, hold your breath, and then clench your fists, and then... You, you just can't do that. And the reason is, is because it, remembering is a part of living. And life in the spirit is part of living. <coughs> you just simply do it. <coughs> so that's where I were trying to avoid specifying these kinds of things. <coughs> and at the same time, trying to show you where some of the myths are in Christianity. Where things really aren't quite so red hot. Okay. Now... <clears throat> I want to step back to one, uh, one area. We had gotten as far as Acts 18, but I wanted to go back to Acts uh, <coughs> excuse me, 16, because I, I noticed one there today. That's a good one to uh, consider also. <clears throat> Acts 16, verse 9. Actually, this is the same chapter with the spirit of uh, divination. Acts 16.9. This is Paul. <clears throat> this is, let's go back to verse uh, 6 and 7, because this is where we, remember, 
They had gone throughout uh, Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. How did God communicate that? I don't know. He has a way of making his will known. After they had come to Mysia, they essayed, they decided, they chose, they determined to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit wouldn't let them. And life in the Spirit is that real. You are alive in a dimension you have never had life before. And you relate to life it's deep calling to deep. It's, it's kind calling to kind. And the Feast of Trumpets relates to the communication of God, his letting you know what his will is. It's important to understand the will of God. Now there's a how-to for you although it doesn't say how to, how to. Romans 12.1 says, present your body a living sacrifice that you may prove what God's will is. There's a how to, but it doesn't tell you how to present your body a living sacrifice. So it's just like riding the bicycle. You say, Lord, here I go. My body's yours. I'm going to sacrifice it. It's going to be a living sacrifice. And that's how I feel about it. And maybe it's dead center, maybe it isn't. Maybe it isn't quite what God wants, maybe it is. You have, you have to determine that. You can't look at a scripture like that and say, well, we had a, a living body sacrifice ceremony at church last week, and so we all went through the steps, the four steps that gave the living body sacrifice its validity, and uh, so it's done. And that's what we do. That's precisely what we do. It's not talking about that. You have to find out what that means. And you have to go to your maker. You have to go to Jesus and say, Now, Lord, I want to know what your will is. You say, I have to present my body a living sacrifice, and that I do. Other than that, I don't know what it means, other than somehow maybe I don't belong to myself anymore, or something like that. And it's all true, and I want you, and... And that's it. There's nothing more than you can do. And we can cheer each other on by saying, you know, well, paddle harder or, you know, something. <clears throat> but it's your responsibility to determine that. <clears throat> and without that, there's no life in the Spirit. It's your job. We, we can help characterize it for you. And the Bible helps to characterize it. But you have to touch the Master for yourself. And only you know when that's happening and when it's not happening. And sometimes even at that, you don't know if it's happening. So it all uh, it rests on you, and we can cheer you on, and I hope you cheer me on. <clears throat> okay. Then the scripture I wanted to point to was, um, what was that, verse 9? Yeah. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. A vision. A night vision. That was God. And that's why the Lord didn't want him going to Asia or into Bithynia. It seemed like a good idea at the time to Paul. The Holy Spirit said no. And the Holy Spirit demonstrated the will of God in this way by night vision. And so, verse 10, And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go to Macedonia. And I like this phrase, Assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Savor that. When you use the word gathering, you are, when you say, I gather that you really are not interested in this matter, what are you saying about your certainty? Well, the facts presented, that's the uh, assumption that you 
Right. You're suggesting that you are predisposed to that opinion. When you say, I gather that this is true, it certainly is a far cry from saying, I am certain that this is true. But they add another word to this, which balances, we are, we assuredly, assuredly gathering. And that's a good description of life in the spirit. <laughs> you're kind of sure that you're not sure, and you're not sure that you're sure, but it's sure enough that uh, what you're not sure about isn't going to stop you. So here's this night vision, and they say, what do you think, Paul? And Paul says, well, what do you think? Do you think it's the Lord? Well, I think it's the Lord. What do you think? And, well, it kind of sounded like the Lord. And, and he reasoned this through to, the, to enough that he went. Maybe he reasoned. Maybe he said, well, you know, the Lord did stop us from going into Asia, and he did stop us from going to Bithynia. He closes one door. Maybe this is a door that's open. I don't know. But the process that they went through, and I think the Holy Spirit will not tell us this process because it's our responsibility to understand what the will of the Lord is. Be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And it's not always conveyed the same way, the same time. So they were assuredly, they assuredly gathered that it was what God wanted to do. Yes. Doesn't the Lord want us to be more sure, though, than that? I mean, to be positive on stuff? Because, like, let's say they were assuredly sure that this was the right thing to do, and yet, with their reasoning, <coughs> they chose the wrong thing to do. How would the Lord look upon that? Would he say, well, you know, you did the best you could, or you stupid idiots, you didn't see it my way? Or, you know, how does he, what does he respond? How do you respond? Well, God is equitable in his judgment, but missing God's will certainly isn't doing God's will. Yeah, see, that's what the trouble is, you know. That's what the trouble is, and that's why, by and large, Christians do not live in the Spirit. And what life they have in the Spirit is sporadic. It really is worth your life to find out what God's will is. And that's why the early part of your Christian life doesn't have this kind of perplexity in it anywhere nearly as it does later on. See, it's after Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit that he's led into the wilderness. Afterwards, not before, it's after. You have to be equipped for life in the spirit. You have to grow because uh, warfare is part of this life. You have to be strong. You have to understand the weapons of our warfare. You have to exercise them. So correspondingly, the Christian life, let me see if I can answer your question a little better. <clears throat> One of the things that characterizes the Christian life in part is doubt uncertainty. We look through a glass darkly. We don't know why. We don't. We don't understand one-tenth of what God has for us or what's happening. And so much of what we do is simply an approximation. Don't conceive of your path of one that God has these very exacting hurdles for you to jump, these very, very careful steps laid out for you, where if you miss one, never again can you ever be doing God's will because that step was critical. That's not a good concept. The scriptures don't teach that at all. The scriptures teach things like if a man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. See, there's always hope. There's always, unless you uh, blow it and real bad, which you can do, there, there's, he expects you to pick yourself up. He really does. He, he expects you to exercise hope and trust and faith. And in fact, in fact uh, Carol, I think uh, something she read uh, today in, in, during devotions touched on that, and that was, the idea that what verifies the saint in God's eyes to the dismay of Satan, 
when they remain faithful throughout times of darkness. See, they have nothing to go on, but they just put one foot in front of another. They say, Lord, I don't see, I don't understand, but I trust you, and that is worth much. And you don't have that if God is always showing you, not today I want you to go down to the store and, uh, and buy a new hat, and then tomorrow, uh, you know, go visit Sister Sally, and tomorrow after that. That is, that is not what the, what the Christian life is like, this endless list of things to do that God has to tell us specifically. And we have that in the Old Testament. I forget which psalm it is. Maybe we can look it up. God says, I don't want to lead you like a horse with a bridle. I don't want to do that. Turn right, turn left. He says, I want to guide you with my eye. I want to guide you with my eye. I want to, with a glance, communicate the world to you and tell you what's on my mind. It's a nuance. You know, it's kind of um, like the way a husband and a wife can communicate. Just one look just says everything. A parent can do that with a child, too. One look is worth a million words. And so being able to see Jesus in the Spirit is therefore an important part. And it's just he takes, it's one look. And sometimes that look is a frown. Sometimes that look just simply tells you the direction. Sometimes it's a look of assurance. Sometimes you say, wow, Lord, you know, this is more than I bargained for, and I, I just feel like it's over my head, and good grief, what's happening? And you look at him, and it's assurance. And when, when you get that, you don't need a million Bible verses. But when you don't have that, we have the Bible verses. So the Christian life will never be that way. Perhaps it'll be that way during eternity. I don't know, but I rather doubt it. A little later on, <clears throat> when we get through uh, these scriptures here, I hope to talk a little more specifically about determining God's will and the relationship of your mind and your own will. Because there's a very close relationship between all three of those components. And let me just make a statement now to help, help answer your, your question. It says in the first psalm, Blessed is the man. This is talking about the righteous man. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But he makes his delight in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season. And then this is the statement here. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now think about that. It doesn't say, and whatever he hears correctly from the Lord makes things better or turns out to be pleasing to God or is better life in the spirit or any such thing whatever it is that he does prospers basically this means that when you are walking in the spirit your judgment becomes God's judgment. Your choices are God's choices, not because he tells you what to do, but it's because you have had a transformation of your will so that what you really want is what he really wants. Therefore, when you choose what should be done, it is correct. And it prospers, even though the choice was yours. And that's different from having God say, and we do, just like we were puppets. That is not life in the spirit. God says we do, God says we do. Now, there are times when he commands us, and we, we do. So we're not saying that that is not so. Okay, yes, you have a question. I think you just answered it, but 
So there are certain things in our lives so that God has specific, this is it, this is not it. But then there are other portions of our life where it's like you said. So it, so there are portions that, that are definite from the Lord. They are both the same. What I'm suggesting to you is that they are both the same. God works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. That means that he, the process of formulating his purposes for, for you are wrought in you yourself. He changes you so that what you want is what he wants. Therefore, when you do what you want, you are doing God's will. Now you can see how dangerous that is because if you're in the flesh, you're wrong. And if you're following Satan, you're wrong. But the answer to that is, therefore, I will have no will of my own. And you hear Christians say, I have no will of my own. Avoid that kind of talk. The Bible doesn't talk that way. You will leave yourself, you leave yourself empty of, of no will, of no desire, and something will come and fill it. Guaranteed, something. And it's not going to be friendly. The Christian learns in life and the spirit to keep his choices red hot. He is always choosing. It's choose you this day whom you will serve. And what God rather does is put before you choices. <coughs> there may be a temptation before you and a way to escape before you. You choose. You choose. You use your judgment, you use your understanding, and then you go for it. Otherwise, the Christian life would be what you were characterizing earlier, and that is God says we do, God says we do, God says we do. And that is not a good characterization. And we've already seen the book of Acts. God will say, separate unto me, Saul and Barnabas, for the work I have called them to. God can speak from heaven any time he wants. But, you'll, but you see that Paul was trying to go into Bithynia. He was using his will. He was judging that it was suitable. And God said no. I'll give you another example in the book of James. James says, don't say tomorrow I, I will buy and sell. Then what does it say? What you're rather supposed to say is, I'm, I don't even know if I'm supposed to buy or sell or not, but what I'll do, I'll wait till God shows me whether I'm supposed to buy or sell. Is that what it says? No. No, you add something to it. You say, if God wills, tomorrow I will buy and sell. So, doing God's will does not remove from your choice making. You still choose tomorrow to buy or sell. But you don't do so as though God's not around. You say, no, Lord, if this is your will, this is my choice. This is what I feel is proper before you. And that is how you perform the will of God. Then, at other times... God may stop you right in your tracks and say, no, don't do that. He may not. But requiring that the Christian life be these endless interventions is not a good characterization at all. And again, I remind you of the psalm. I don't want to lead you like a horse with a bridle. Anybody can, any horse can be led with a bridle in their mouth, except maybe a mule it's easy. You get tug this way, you turn right, you tug that way, you go left. That's not what God's after. God wants to lead you with his eye. He wants, to, he wants you to understand so that you make righteous choices in the face, in the midst of a demonic environment. And that is very precious. You don't realize what happens to the fabric of your personality being joined with Christ when... The pressure says, don't serve God, and you say, well, you know, honey, I think today we, we're just going to serve God today. We're going to do what we know is right. And that is someone who is doing God's will. <clears throat> yes? That was Psalm 32.8. Psalm 32.8. Well, let's look at that, because that's... Uh... <laughs> 
Psalms 32, 8. Psalms 32, 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you shall go. I will guide you with my eye. That's a very gentle, very, you know, there's no direct contact between his eye and us. He doesn't put his hand on us. That would be a direct contact. It's just his look. And so, boy, do you have to be alert and watching. Be you not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held with a bit bit and a bridle, lest they come near unto you. In other words, you don't want them over this side of of the place, so you pull the bridle of the bit in the other direction. He said, I don't want you that way. I will teach you. I will instruct you in the way, and then I'll guide you with my eye. That's life in the Spirit. And it takes a combination of all things. It takes the wisdom of Christ, it's His grace, it takes His mercy, it takes your diligence, patience, sincerity, knowledge. All of these things are necessary. Conflict, doubt, dismay, And through all of that, you find God's will and practice it. Sometimes you do God's will and you don't know you're doing it. Sometimes you don't do God's will and you don't know you're doing it. Sometimes you don't do God's will and you know you're not doing it. Sometimes you do God's will and you know. All of the above. The idea is to... Have your senses exercised to gain greater skill in understanding. It's a matter of skill. And the capability proceeds from Christ himself. The basis of that capability of living in the Spirit proceeds from the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the basis of it. We'll get to that shortly. And that's important. Otherwise, the Christian life becomes boisterous, arrogant, legalistic, and that's why most, many, I should say most, many who live deeper lives in Christ get hard. Jesse Penn Lewis called them holy yet hard. And it's because they, rather than being drawn into the cross and living a crucified life, they take all of their past in Christ And without that death, try to live the life. And so the thing that animates, that gives life to this life, is the soul. It's the natural man. And it goes nowhere. And sooner or later, it brings its own uh, own fruit, which we'll see in Romans 8. It's no way to to fly. Okay, so let's see. Let's then turn to... uh, Man, we're still in the first verse here. Um... Acts chapter uh, 18. I like this because this shows that living in the Spirit, you, this is Acts 18.25, this shows that living in the Spirit doesn't necessarily mean you have to have all the world's wisdom of Christ and all the knowledge and you don't have to be you know, the super saint before you can live in the Spirit. And let, let me show you how I get that from this. Acts 18.25 This was uh, Apollos. He was a Jew who was born in Alexandria. He was an eloquent man, mighty in the Scriptures. And he comes to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. So he understands God, being fervent in spirit. Not just fervent, fervent in spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. See, his knowledge was partial. 
but that that didn't interfere with the process of living in the spirit. It doesn't. What God does is then bring you a, an Aquila and a Priscilla and say, well, you know, what you have is really tremendous. Can we help? Can we help add? And so uh, that's what it says. And, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And so that's why faith is like a grain of mustard seed. It, just ha it doesn't have to be much, but it does have to be planted and it does have to be nurtured. And that is sufficient for growth. And God will see to it, as long as you are faithful in what you have, God will see to it. All you have to, if even all you know is the baptism of John, God will see to it that you begin to understand a more perfect way. So life in the Spirit is not this way far out thing that only, you know, only the, the apostles themselves attain to. It's, it's the ordinary Christian life. And it is more a matter of to what extent you are in the Spirit and to what extent your natural man is, is governing you still. <coughs> and then Acts 19.21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit. <coughs> Where did the, 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 the faculty to decide reside? Well, where is his will residing? In the spirit. He purposed in the spirit. See, in life in the spirit, there are attributes to your spiritual life which have counterparts in the natural life. You can sing with your understanding. You can also sing with your spirit. You can pray with your understanding. You can pray in the spirit. You can purpose with your understanding. You can purpose in your spirit. You can, remember, you can grieve with your understanding. And you can grieve in the spirit. Spiritual life, in many ways, has counterparts to the natural man but they are decidedly different. One of the purposes of the Word of God, according to Hebrews, is for it to be a sharp two-edged sword to divide the soul and the spirit. It's as though when we first come to Christ, He gives us life, but that life is mixed in with our soulish life. And so we really don't know the difference between the two. We, we know something tremendous has happened. A lot of changes uh, come about right away. We see things we have never seen before. And that's because life is present that hasn't been before. But there's still... So we who were spiritually dead become spiritually alive. But there needs to be more of a process, according to Hebrews 4. And that is, these two lives need to be separated so that they are distinguishable to you, so that you know when you are purposing with one or the other, whether you be, are being influenced by one or the other. Now, that's not to say that the spirit is good and the soul is bad. That's, that goes nowhere. Bless the Lord, O my soul. The, you know, the, we believe under the saving of the soul. The soul is, is one of the things that God is interested in, but not simply for the sake of the soul. Because Adam was a living soul, and when you were born, you were born with a soul, but your spirit was dead. In Christ, your spirit is made alive, and now we go through a, a process of transformation until we are conformed to the image of God's Son, until Christ in his completeness is formed within us. It begins small and grows. We begin as babies. We need milk, the simple things, and as we grow... We understand greater things. We understand things uh, more perfectly. So one way you grow in the spirit is, is to have the attitude, you know, Lord, it's tremendous what you've shown me. And what I understand, it's incredible. But I'm not going to grasp it like it's something that I own. Rather, I'm going to count that there's more of you. I'm not going to count that I've arrived, but I am going to count that there's more of you. That there's a more perfect way. And that the things in me that displease you really can be done away with. 
so that the life that I live, and that's what Galatians 2.20 is. I am crucified with Christ. See, that, that is life in the Spirit. But you're not dead. It doesn't mean a zombie kind of life. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And you really do live. Except now your life has roots in something else other than the natural man. Your life in the natural man you have because you were born the first time. But this other life must be nurtured. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. You actually draw your life from another source than your natural life. Such that if your natural life expires, other than the, the collapse of your uh, physical being, nothing in you changes. Because that's not where your life is. <clears throat> so when your body dies, you don't, you don't skip a beat. See? Though he perish, he, he, he does not die. And that's the purpose of redemption. So, let me restate that. The purpose of redemption is to create a transforming process such that you are converted from a soulish, worldly, sinful life to a life that proceeds only from Christ. And the last vestige of that process is the resurrection from the dead. That's the capstone. That's when the expectation is, is that all had been done in this transforming process and then the last enemy to be destroyed is death itself. And to show that death has been conquered, your body comes out of the ground. Your real, this carcass comes out of the ground. See, it was the last thing that could not submit to this life in the spirit. And it has pleased God to do it that way. That the body's conforming to life in the spirit occurs at the resurrection. And so this body is raised, it's clothed upon with life from heaven, according to uh, 2 Corinthians, and then we live eternally in the same body that we have now. No, and looking at Jesus is our example, because he had the nail prints in his hand. If we don't throw this body away and get another one, Living in Christ means we have gone through the transformation such that there is only one more issue, and that is the body itself. That body then is raised from the dead, and we'll see this in Romans 8, and see what the implications of life in the Spirit. Let, let me say it ahead of time, just <clears throat> so you can fasten your seatbelts. If you don't live in the Spirit, Christian or not, we're not talking about being saved, we're talking about the resurrection. Having your body come out of the ground is a different act than being rescued from the lake of fire. If you do not live in the spirit, you will not be raised from the dead. And Romans 8 says that plainly. If you go to excess in not living in the spirit and go back to the life that you had in Egypt, the Bible says it's worse for you. It's like a dog returning to its vomit. It's worse. And it says it would have been better if you hadn't even known than to know and the term. So the church is in a real testy situation in these days because the coming of the Lord is soon. I don't believe it's this year. But it is soon. It is soon. The pressure is on. And correspondingly, we are... We're kind of in the early stages of the parable of the ten virgins. Ten virgins, ten pure, ten holy. And the thing that distinguishes the two are their folly and their wisdom and the amount of oil that they have. And oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit and it's a picture of life in the Spirit. It's a picture of being adequately prepared for his coming. And most of the parables, be interesting to take account and, and see what the percentage is, most of the parables are a warning about not being prepared, to us, about not being prepared when the Lord comes. And he, he, he characterizes it in all kinds of different ways, so we ought to get the message. So that's why life in the Spirit is not, it's not um, whoop-de-doo. 
It's something that we give ourselves to. We expect to grow in it. We expect life in the Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit. And that's why if we say we've been filled with the Spirit, we better see some fruit. If we're a cherry tree, we ought to see the little red things hanging out somewhere. Love, joy, peace, gentleness. But if we're fighting each other, Paul says, and debating and devouring each other, he says, you're of the flesh. You're not of the Spirit. Man, them, them's fighting words. What, Paul? You don't, you don't realize I went through the four steps. Well, that may be, and I may be accepted of Christ, but I'm living in the flesh and accepted of Christ, which means my acceptation, I think, is enough to keep me out of the lake of fire. So that's, that's tremendous. But there's so much more in Christ than, than keeping out of the lake of fire. Boy, there's, there's all kinds of richness and grace and goodness and majesty. I hope your Christian life is not based on whether or not you can keep out of the lake of fire or not. That's no way to live. But many do, and that's in 1 Corinthians. Many are saved, even so as by fire. And it says, in their spirit shall be saved. Boy, that, that awkwardly leaves out a couple of things, like his soul and his body and... But it says if he's so if he's you know if it's wood hay and stubble, uh, he'll make it. He'll make it. That's a person who lived in the flesh, and it profited nothing. It went nowhere. And God looks at it, and there's nothing there worth saving. But he sees life in the spirit, what little there is, and so he squeaks by, and he's saved. And the expression the Bible uses, even so as by fire. In other words, the fire devours all of this other stuff, and there's something left over that's worth saving. And so that's God's delight to save. He, he doesn't want anybody to miss. But it's a question, life in the Spirit raises the question of how much are you going to be saved? Peter uses the expression, and so having an abundant entrance into the kingdom. So you can enter the kingdom in a couple of ways. You can sneak in the back door while the door is closing and whew, barely make it, or you can hear the trumpets blowing and the angels rejoicing, the doors flung wide, and one or t'other, or maybe somewhere in between. And the difference is whether you are sowing to the Spirit or sowing to the flesh. Okay. Verse, uh, verse 20 and uh, <clears throat> chapter 20. And I want to, uh, I want now to We've alluded to this kind of problem of life in the Spirit. And so this is the example I promise you we'd, uh, we'd look at. Acts chapter 20, verse uh, 22. <clears throat> this is Paul speaking. And now behold, Acts 20, verse, chapter 20, verse 22. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. And it's interesting because he's going to be bound also in the flesh to go to Jerusalem. And so being bound in the flesh in chains or however they did is just the outworking of what was actually happening in life in the spirit. Not knowing the things that shall befall me there. So when you are living in the spirit, sometimes you just see the next step. And beyond that, you haven't the faintest idea what God is doing. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with having enough grace for the day. In fact, that's a good characterization of the Christian life. Enough manna for one day. Just enough. And if you have a little more than you need, what's, what's that a sign of? That you're supposed to save it and spend it on a rainy day? If you have more than you need, what are you to do with it? Give it to those who have lack. And therefore, if you're one that has lack, no problem. Someone else has excess. And that grace is available for you too. That's the Christian life, day at a time. So he says, I don't know what's going to happen, except, now this he does know, that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, and evidently every place he went, people would just would, uh, would give this uproar saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. So everyone was warning Paul of what was going to happen. And this impressed him greatly, didn't it? No. no. <laughs> you got to watch this. 
Yeah, the very next source. But none of these things move me. Why is that? Why is it that everyone's proclamation about what was going to happen was not a, didn't influence him? Because he was crucified with Christ, nevertheless he lived. Yes, he was bound in the spirit. It doesn't didn't matter what people said. See, God had put it in his heart. And he knew it was. And so if people testify of it, fine. If they don't, fine. It simply does not matter. Be careful when your Christian life is couched only in terms of the testimony of others. Where you kind of, you kind of go to someone else and you say, yeah, gee, how do you think I'm doing? Hey, that's no way to live in Christ. The way you live in Christ is you go to the Lord. Lord, how do you think I'm doing? Well, he'll tell you. He'll tell you. Sure he will. Do that. Do that tonight. Say, now, Lord, you know, I really haven't, I really don't know. I'm, I'm just kind of, I haven't heard for a while. Could I have a report card? Would you just, how am I doing? Is, am I offending you every day? Am I pleasing you? He'll do that. Sure he will. You don't, you don't get it all the time. But if it's been a while, I, I rather suspect. I rather suspect that his response to you will rather be generous to comfort you because many of us are right in God's will and don't have the 1% of the satisfaction of knowing it. And so he'll, his first response, uh, unless you're in bad shape, which can be, uh, he may rebuke you right off. He may say, you know, get thee behind me, you savor the things of man and not the things of God. He'll do that. Absolutely. I, I remember going to him uh, some time ago, and um, I think I was a little cocky in my attitude. You know, I was kind of saying, well, Lord, how's it going? You know, how's it going? And first thing he said, not everything you do pleases me. Oh, no. I knew that this was the beginning of a season. Say, okay, Lord, let, I'm your servant. What is it? What is it? Show me. Lead me. And so that's exactly what happened was a, about a six-month catharsis. Of, oh, and when you see what it is, you say, how could I have ever have missed that? He's so wise. So that's what you hear sometimes. Other times you're likely to hear, you know, my son, my daughter, I love you. You're, you're a delight to me. Try it. Develop that kind of relationship to the Lord. You can only do it through the Spirit of God. It's the only way. Don't look for the human replica of that. It will not serve you. <clears throat> Ask the Lord for the real thing. So that's why it didn't move Paul. Yes. It means that spiritually he was absolutely certain that he had only one avenue to go, and that was to, uh, uh, to Jerusalem and to be bound and eventually end up in Rome. Uh, it's, like, um, um, it's, it's like the term, uh, what city is this bus bound for? It's that kind of use of the word bound. It has to do with direction and certainty and destination. Uh, and not so much that he was, you know, in bondage. In a way it is, uh, but, but not in the sense that he was helpless, but in the sense that there was one destiny for the Apostle Paul as far as he was concerned, and, and no one could persuade him otherwise. Well, sure enough, and I guess uh, we're going to be out of time, so uh, we'll... Uh, Next hour we'll, uh, <clears throat> we'll, we'll convey this. Sure enough, when you are that firm in your spirit, it'll get tested. And that's exactly what happens to Paul. And I'll tell you now, uh, before we start the next session, and that is somebody stands up and in the spirit prophesies, you're thus saith the Lord, you're not to go to Jerusalem. And then what do you do? Well, we'll show you what Paul does, and, uh, and we'll see if that helps, because it'll happen. It'll happen. Well, let's pray. 
Father, we thank you that you have so much more for us, Lord, than what we have seen so far. And we pray, Lord, that all of the scriptures might just come alive and enrich us, Lord, that we might be followers of you, that we, through faith and patience, might inherit the promises. We declare before you, Lord, that it is our delight to do your will. And we pray, therefore, that you would lead us and guide us, that we might be transformed, Lord, and completely made over, Lord, that we be new creatures in Christ Jesus, old things passed away and all things new. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.